Hello again, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to moderate the fourth session of the day. Uh, the session will address the question, how do the impacts on notions of responsibility that have been found measure up to the original concerns about geneticization? And we have two excellent presenters. Uh, first, we have Paul Martin, who is, apologies, uh, uh, professor of sociology in the Department of Sociological Studies at the University of Sheffield. Dr. Martin is the former director of the University of Nottingham Institute for Science and Society and currently conducts research at the interface of science and technology studies and medical sociology. Um, after Dr. Martin's talk, we will pass it over to uh, Carlos Novas. Dr. Novas is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. He teaches in the field of science and technology studies. Uh, his research interest includes biopolitics, the life sciences, biotechnology, patients, organizations, and bioethics. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Martin. So um, I just want to check you can see my slides. Yes. And there. Perfect. There we go. Does that work? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I must uh, apologize first. I returned from holiday an hour ago and I'm still rather in holiday mode. So trying to, I've been listening to the, um, the fantastic conference uh, as we've been going at the motorway on my mobile phone. So I've been following events, but um, I'm maybe not quite as sharp as I would be normally. So, but thank you very much for the organizers, for, for Lucas and Eric and, and the other organizers for inviting me to come along. I'm going to present something a little bit different. Um, I'm a medical sociologist, normally doing empirical research, but uh, I'm gonna present essentially a conceptual piece here. Um, this follows on from an article that um, my colleague Kate Viner led, but I was co-author on about geneticization, which is I think why I got the invitation. Uh, and I'm going to uh, explore uh, my thinking in particular that's evolved since the article was published about four years ago. So the aims of the talk are to, about the changing ideas of genetic responsibility, and this is in the context of the co-evolution of technology and norms. And in particular, I want to elaborate the idea of regimes of normativity. So this is the idea that uh, norms co-evolve with technical change. And I want to try and chart in a very general way what I regard as some of the changes that are occurring, both in relationship to the technology, but also in terms of the norms associated with rare diseases. So in particular, I want to use this idea of the monogenic regime, and I'll explain what that is in a minute and give a brief history. So this is a bit of a historical sort of overview. Some of the details you may disagree with, uh, and um, this is still very much early work in terms of elaborating. This is not written paper, um, though I've written something specifically on regimes of normativity that, that we may refer to. And I mentioned the shift in focus from, I think, uh, in a lot of genomics, uh, from common to rare diseases. And again, I'll explain what I mean by that. And finally, that's about describing changes in this normative, uh, in this monogenic regime from biological to therapeutic citizenship. So, and making a social theoretical argument based on some overview uh, analysis of what I think is going on in the field and trying to relate this to changing ideas of genetic responsibility, the themes of this uh, meeting. So I, I'm not going to find genetic responsibility is just a standard definition that, that case given here. Uh, that's been elaborated at great length and in, in fantastic analytical detail during the meeting. But I suppose I want to argue that genetic responsibility depends very strongly on geneticized notions of disease etiology. And that's a point that's been made repeatedly by a number of the contributors to this event. And I think the link between the geneticization thesis and notions of genetic responsibility are central problematic. To what, to ex to what extent the uh, geneticization thesis stands up, if you like, in general, uh, to some extent, determines the generalizability of, or the extent to which we can talk about genetic responsibility more generally. So that's, that's part of the argument. So just to summarize, when we wrote this paper, we were dealing with 
the geneticization debate as uh, expressed by Abby Lippmann in uh, 1991. And this is seeing genetic, sci genetic, genetic science as leading to many aspects of human identity, health, and everyday life being explained in genetic terms. And what we did, Kate did, well, we did together, uh, was reviewed the um, empirical analytical literature on this topic and concluded that relatively little of the original claims of the geneticization thesis have been realized. So this is a bit of a sweeping generalization, but if you read the article, you'll see that we've been quite careful to analyze uh, the full spread of uh, different interpretations of the geneticization thesis, and, and that was our conclusion. And so you might draw from this that the, there was a limited impact of genetic responsibility outside specific domains, and I'll talk about those domains in a minute, due to this lack of a strong link between genes and common diseases. Now, there, there is a link between genes common diseases, but it's not perhaps the one that was initially anticipated by the geneticization thesis. And we can say, well, that was, that was naive perhaps uh, historically, but I want to say, tell a story about how these ideas have evolved over time. Now, before doing that, I'm just going to touch on uh, a model uh, of socio-technical change that I want to use to try and analyze this relationship between changing norms and uh, broader socio-technical change. So within science and technology studies, within SDS, uh, there was no clear distinction made between the social and the scientific or the technological. And so we can think about the analysis of socio-technical systems as being composed of not new knowledge and technological artifacts or organizations and actors that produce knowledge uh, and the infrastructures, the physical market and financial regulatory infrastructures that govern the use of that knowledge. But I think critically importantly, um, we can also talk about uh, the sort of social, cognitive and cultural dimensions of those socio-technical processes. And I've drawn on, I'm not going to talk about this in any detail, I've drawn some literature uh, which is about transition studies and so-called multi-level perspective. Uh, and I just want to highlight that the sort of place of analysis is at this regime level, this is at a meso level. So this is not talking about the sort of grand changes in biomedicine overall or in the very detailed changes in the clinic. This is trying to make a general analysis at this level of uh, a regime. And I'll explain what I mean about that in a minute using an example. So the elements of a regime, these cultural, cognitive, social dimensions, which accompany the sort of hard technological infrastructures and, and artifacts, um, you know, can be summed up here. So in addition to the knowledge, artifacts, actors, organizations, and infrastructures, a regime includes the rule set or grammar that constitutes and govern technologies, skills, corporate culture, artifacts, embodied institutions and infrastructures. So this is talking about, if you like, the social, the softer stuff. I don't want to make this distinction really, but, you know, to give you a feel of that. And what Martin Pickersgill uh, initially sort of elaborated in relationship to science and I've elaborated further with uh, Ilka Turkman darg in a paper that's coming out in, in next year in Union of Access and Society, is this idea of a regime of normativity. So this is about the e co-evolution of systems, technologies, norms, regulations, and future expectations. And it has a number of dimensions, which might include the beliefs, uh, the ethical principles, the informal rules and formal regulations, the routines and institutional practices, and what we call the techno-moral imaginaries, the future expectations. So the argument here is that technical change, socio-technical change, in this case, in the area of genetics, involves not just the introduction of new artifacts, but it also involves changes in this regime that have these different dimensions, these beliefs, these norms, these rules, routines and expectations. And by analyzing those, the way they change over time, we can see the co-evolution of technology and um, norms. So I'm just gonna give a very brief story. This is rather, rather superficial uh, about, if you like, the development of uh, genetic medicine, in particular related to rare diseases, and make an argument about how that has changed over time and its contemporary changes that are affecting the norms that govern uh, these, this, this domain. So, and again, most of you will know all about this, origins and classic genetics, 
uh, clearly, uh, you know, the development of the idea of monogenic diseases, the rise of clinical genetics and specialist services in the post-war era, uh, particularly around genetic testing, particularly prenatal testing for these rare diseases, the inherited in families, the link to genetic counseling, and uh, that inspired the first hunt for genes for cystic fibrosis, for example, in the 1980s. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know there. I'm just saying, this is the context I want to talk about. That's uh, the sort of background to this argument. And I want to uh, argue that the monogenic regime of normativity that was associated with the development of the early days of genetic medicine, very much what we've been talking about today, in terms of beliefs, it's about a genetic basis of etiology for disease causation, genes cause disease, the special status of genetic data, a certain set of norms about genetic responsibility, which is what we've been discussing and analyzing today, notions of, of genetic privacy, the rules and regulations that sort of control that. So we can think about data protection as a one of those sorts of practices, routines and institutional practices as well, genetic counseling, and the techno moral imaginaries are related to that, this expansion of screen and prevent. So I want to argue that this set of this regime of normativity, these, if you like, the sort of grammar of the system, including the sort of normative principles that govern behavior actors in this particular space, co evolved with these emerging clinical practices, these emerging technologies. And that that is where the idea of genetic responsibility was born. Uh, and to some extent has remained, I would argue. So my historical take on this uh, would be that we're attempts to expand this monogenic regime uh, in the sort of 1990s, perhaps early 2000s. Early genomics was very much governed by the search for genes that are strongly associated with common diseases. Uh, and BRCA, I think, was the paradigmatic uh, poster child of that era. Um, so I think, you know, some of the early genomics companies uh, and the early biobanks were predicated on the idea that we would find fairly strong links between single genes often uh, and these common diseases. As we know, this was disappointing. There's early results in that period. Uh, there were very few genes that were strongly linked to common diseases. Uh, and there was a big debate about this missing heritability. Um, so the expected findings from twin studies that these diseases will be strongly inherited did not turn out to be the case. And again, I'm not saying anything new, but I think this is important as a story that the monogenic regime provided the template for those early expansion of genomics in terms of the assumptions about how this would progress. So as we move from genetics to genomics in the 2000s, we obviously have this ex massive expansion in human gene sequencing next generation sequencing, GWAS. Uh, so today we've got over 10,000 GWAS studies, the move to multi-omics, uh, and the introduction of genomics as a broad enabling platform diffused across many areas. So I don't think there is a specific regime of normativity related to genomics per se. I think it's very much domain specific. Um, so if we move to the present time and we think about what's been going on over the last few years, so bring my story forwards, if you like, that despite massive search for genes found that play a major role in common diseases, there's, there's still a lack of progress in that sort of sense. Now, most people have about probably abandoned this. So there's an ongoing debate in the literature about the role of genetic factors in common diseases, the role of uh, common or versus rare, variant, rare variants. There's quite a technical sort of debate about uh, the relative contrib contribution of these very rare variants to common diseases, or whether it's really common variants that contribute to them. I'm not going to go there. I'm not fully qualified to talk about that, but I can read the literature. Uh, so there's been very few genetic tests for common diseases that have anything like the sort of uh, power of the BRCA test outside oncology, and now you have somatic mutations, that's slightly different. Uh, and I think a limited expansion of geneticized disease etiologies. I think we've moved to a much more complex interactional model between the gene, genes and environment, basically. So I think that that's broad, broadly speaking where we're, where we're at. I think many of the discussions at this meeting would, would probably agree with that, certainly in terms of the way they frame their contribution. I want to make an argument then that we're now seeing a bit of a shift and this is because I've uh, started looking much more at orphan diseases and orphan drugs. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, 
but I think there's a series of conversion developments that have led to an expansion of this monogenic regime associated with rare disease in re recent years. So I'm not saying that uh, any of the things I've said so far are now being undermined. I think this is still restricted to talk about rare diseases that have a monogenic sort of basis in a single gene normally. But I think the development of whole genome sequencing and gene discovery, tests for monogenic conditions, orphan drugs and gene therapy, and rare disease patient activism through these rare disease patient organizations has changed the dynamics uh, and this, this uh, evolution, if you like, of this monogenic regime is now moving in quite a, a, a different direction, perhaps where we might have thought it was going in the first place. So I'm just gonna give you a few overheads that summarize some of the empirical evidence for this. We can, again, we can question this and say this is rather provisional but it gives you a flavor for the argument. So whole genome sequencing, again, you'll know it's been rolled out in many countries. The UK is leading, I think, the world in terms of the adoption within its healthcare system. So we've established the UK NHS Genomic Medicine Service, which is going to sequence 500,000 new genomes uh, by uh, in the next two or three years. And the focus is very much in two areas, is on rare diseases, is on cancer, on somatic mutations. Um, there's also proposals for large-scale screening of children, um, firstly in the context of uh, where they have unknown diseases that may have a genetic etiology, but perhaps more generally. And we're seeing this ma massive ramp up in terms of uh, capacity, sequencing capacity. So certainly in the UK, the commitment to screening, uh, sequencing whole genomes and linking that to rare diseases is very much part of the central push within UK. Uh, genomics. As, as one of the results of this is this increasing number of genes discovered. So again, this is no surprise. This is the characterization of genes that have uh, increasingly their functions understood and may form the basis for either uh, elaborating disease pathways, particularly rare disease pathways, if they're rare variants, uh, but also the basis of tests for some of those rare variants as well. I say I'm going to skim over this very quickly. If we look at the number of genetic cancers, this is uh, in the United States, we've seen a steady growth in this. So you know, more people involved in this work as a result of the sort of screening programs and tests that have been introduced, particularly prenatal ones. Uh, if we look at the growth in orphan drugs. So the argument I want to hear is that, uh, make here is that we're seeing a shift from an emphasis on diagnostics to also including therapeutics. And I think that's the key event that's going on here. So often le drug legislation has been very successful over the last 20 years, an increasing number of products each year. It's interesting that something like 40% of all new drugs approved by the FDA in recent years have been for orphan drugs or drugs with orphan indications. And they're um, increasingly starting to represent a very significant part of the global pharmaceutical market. Uh, so that's predicted to be something like 20 to 25% of the global market in the next few years. And that's particularly true in the United States. And um, that's by, by value. Um, we're also seeing the growth in gene therapy. Again, not going to go into this in any detail, but the key point is here that most of the gene therapies that are being developed at the moment are for rare conditions, broadly defined, uh, often cancers. Um, so we're seeing a growth in therapeutics, both orphan drugs in general and gene therapies in specific, specifically, that are again emphasizing the genetic etiology, the causation, a single gene leading to a disease that can then be treated. So the argument I'm wanting to make is a set of convergent trends. And I think that's been backed up by this shift to what might be called rare disease politics where we've seen the continued growth and influence of rare disease patient organizations, which have bio, powerful biosocial uh, identities and effective claims. So uh, about the need to find cures. Um, and, and that's led to dedicated rare disease policies in many countries. So we now see across Europe, a whole series of uh, rare disease frameworks and policies that governments now paying increasingly uh, attention to and in the increasing influence of patient organizations in the pharmaceutical sector. I'm very struck by attending pharmaceutical meetings at the moment by how, how patient groups are absolutely central to many of the discussions 
about regulatory change, about clinical development, the whole direction of the industry. Uh, and increasingly patient groups becoming involved in drug development, particularly rare disease patient groups. So I want to argue that there's been this expansion of the, this monogenic regime, if you like, that started off in classical clinical genetics associated with rare conditions through these new accounts of rare variants in common disease etiology. So uh, that's trying to account for this missing heritability, trying to account for the role of genetic factors in common diseases. It's emphasizing these rare variants. Uh, I think there's a growing number of tests and therapies for these rare diseases. An increasing percentage of the population perhaps is being diagnosed as, as having a rare disease and may not be a, a, a major rare disease. It may be, you know, um, we could take tests and we're saying at risk of having, uh, because of having a particular rare variant of this increased, increased chance of getting a condition or whatever. But this narrative around the causal role of these rare variants, I think, is starting to become a, a central part of the narratives in contemporary gen genomics. The massive industrial investments in orphan products that's been going on for some time now, uh, particularly now in ratio gene therapy, and the rise in the influence of patient groups. And so what I want to argue is that this has led to changes in this monogenic regime of normativity. So there's greater emphasis on access to therapy. So attending the meetings uh, I now go to on orphan uh, products and rare disease patient groups. Uh, the access to therapy is absolutely one of the central demands, certainly in advanced developing countries. Uh, you know, I think there's a set of caveats there. This is very much an ang uh, sort of North American European uh, set of observations. So I don't want to generalize beyond that, but I think there's greater emphasis on access to therapies. Uh, and I think new normative discourses about the rights for patients who have these diseases to life, in particular the, their children's lives, because most of these diseases affect children. Uh, and the right to access to a cure. So where a drug is on the market, then getting access to it, timely access to it, affordable access to that. And I think a set of new ethical imperatives and obligations are now being articulated to find a cure and ensure access to save lives. So in terms of these notions of genetic responsibility, I want to argue that we're seeing new discourses, new collective responsibilities for families, for patient groups, for companies and policymakers. And the techno moral imaginary about the future is about cures for all. So cures, the, 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 if the idea, ideal is that uh, articulated in these communities is that, that uh, people with rare diseases have a right to a cure and they, that, that is being articulated in, in various rights discourses. And so I've just got a few uh, sort of screen grabs here of um, some of these rights-based and responsibility-based narratives that I think are uh, being linked to ideas of hope and innovation. And I think what's really striking is that how technological innovation within the pharmaceutical sector is now seen as the way forwards to, for solving these issues and the industry is articulating its responsibility to finding those cures. Now, we can be skeptical, cynical about, about those in terms of these discourses, but in terms of this, the shift in, if you like, in, in these discourses around responsibility, I think they are, they are very significant. And I want to ar ar argue this represents a shift from biological to therapeutic citizenship. And we can uh, talk about this more in, in Q and A. Um, so, Rosen Novus, uh, so I'm delighted Carlos is here to, as a discussant, articulated this idea of biological citizenship, particularly in relationship to, in the first instance, uh, Huntington's disease, the rare patient organisation that had a new collective biosocial identity in which rights and responsibilities were articulated in terms of genetic ideas of uh, the body and uh, disease etiology. And this idea of therapeutic citizenship, first articulated by Nguyen in relationship to HIV, is about how individuals living with a disease appropriate therapy as a set of rights to therapy and responsibilities for self-care. And so what I'm arguing, and I think this is, uh, you know, this is a hypothesis, 
is that we're seeing a shift now in this monogenic regime from one which is concerned primarily with, if you like, diagnostics. I'm not saying that's gone away, but, uh, but I think it's now being complemented very significantly by these new notions of responsibility to find a cure and to give access to medicines. And that those are moving from an individual to a collective sense of uh, responsibility. And that coincides fundamentally with the emergence of these new uh, ideas about uh, the, the, rare, the role of rare variants in genetic in disease etiology, the uh, introduction of whole genome sequencing to enable the search for that. But I think, I think especially the, the increasing role of the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies in rare disease drug discovery and the power also the rising power, if you like, of rare disease patient organizations to articulate these new rights and responsibilities within this space in relationship to access to medicines. So, um, so I think there's an agenda for research here. I'm fundamentally an empirical uh, researcher. So to what extent are we seeing these new discourses, responsibility amongst patients, groups, patient organizations, companies, and policymakers? So oh, it is this, this notion of a right to therapy or this notion of therapeutic citizenship actually occurring? So I think that is an empirical question. How can this concept of therapeutic citizenship be elaborated in this context? And are these developments extending beyond rare diseases? Now, I think this is really absolutely critical. I am not convinced about that. I don't think we're seeing a sort of renaissance in highly geneticized accounts of common diseases in any uh, simplistic way. I think, you know, these will be much more complicated, the multifactorial complex accounts that are being given. But I think within the rare disease space, I'm arguing that's been expanded very significantly by new technical developments, but also by these other factors. So I just want to plug um, my penultimate slide. This is a new project. So one of the things that uh, I'm doing is this uh, major research project on orphan drugs funded by the Wellcome Trust. I, I can talk more about it if people are interested. But that's looking at this relationship between industrial dynamics, uh, the politics of high orphan drug prices, and patient groups and new models of drug innovation. So that's trying to understand and untangle and analyze this relationship between technical change, the role of industry, patient groups, and these new normative claims, as well as where, the way in which these technologies and developments are being governed. So it's trying to look in the round at these things as they co-evolve over time. So in conclusion, I want to make a really strong plea that normativities co-evolve with socio-technical change. So we can't divorce the broader development of these new technologies, these new infrastructures, new platforms, and uh, ways of, uh, in which innovation is proceeding from the norms, beliefs, expectations that are uh, sort of govern and shape their uh, creation and deployment. And the idea of geneticization and genomic responsibility are embedded in what I call this monogenic regime. So when we talk about genetic responsibility, I would still argue that it's fundamentally linked to these ideas of genetic, uh, of genetic etiology. So in which genes are linked to causing disease and, and that is the fundamental area. And that is primarily restricted to, you know, this, I'm, I'm, you know we can debate the extent to which this is, this is true or not, but to restrict it to talking about rare diseases in the main or rare variants that are responsible for common diseases. So, uh, and that the regime is changing. So technological innovation is co-evolving these new normative discourses and the entry of actors into that domain. And we're seeing the shift from genetic uh, individual responsibility is very clearly articulated to kin and, uh, uh, you know, within the, the, the previous talks, I think, to these new collective obligations to find a cure for these diseases. So I think that's highly speculative in some ways, what I talked about, and I look forward to hearing what Carl's got to say and other people have got to say. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, Carlos, we're ready for you. Uh, feel free to share your screen and... Well, all right, um, so I'll begin. Um, so I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to take part in this conference today. And uh, it's really been great uh, hearing the discussions that we've been having uh, today. Um, I also wanna thank Paul Martin, um, both for sharing his paper in advance of uh, his talk today uh, and that forthcoming paper uh, that's going to be published in New Genetics and Society. And so I think, you know, what I'm really happy with in terms of uh, Paul's talk today is that he gave a really detailed discussion of, you know, the history of genetic counseling and genetic count testing, um, and especially thinking about uh, this monogenetic regime of um, uh, associated with genetics. Um, and in terms of like framing my discussion of Paul's work today, well, I want to really begin by focusing on sort of this concept of the regime of normativity and why I think that's a very significant concept for a number of reasons. And then I'll address the topic that we've been addressed to um, you know, focus upon, which is you know, how notions of responsibility uh, found to measure up to the original concerns about genetization. Um, so I think why this concept of regime of normativity is important um, is its temporality. Um, and so as we can see from Paul's uh, presentation, he developed this historical account of the movement of this regime of normative associated with monogenic diseases to the sort of nascent emergence of a new regime of normativity um, associated around rare diseases, access to therapies, and parents' right to have a healthy genetically related uh, child. And so I think what this does is it really offers us like this real historical or historicity of um, um, ethics in relationship to emerging technological uh, systems. So, you know, as Paul pointed out in the case of um, STS, um, we like to think about, you know, ethics, science, technology, and society as being co-produced. And so I would say that within the field of STS, this idiom of co-production has been uh, quite essential um, over the past 20 years. Um, and I think the reason why it's so important is it allows us to see, you know, society as dynamic, as constantly changing, constantly evolving um, over the course of time. And so, you know, thinking more specifically about um, ethics, when we think about this temporality of regimes of normativity, it allows us to see ethical principles, codes, and guidelines in relation to particular scientific and technological developments as temporary stabilizations rather than something that is timeless um, or universal. I guess the second thing that I really like about, you know, Paul's analysis of uh, regimes of normativity is this, um, has this sort of pluralist conception built in within this uh, conception. Um, and it really allows us to see the role of different social actors in developing ethics, norms, and guidelines um, in relationship to science and technological development. So if we think about, you know, Paul's analysis, you know, he brought into uh, a number of different actions who shape this regime of normativity, you know, from states, regulators, scientists, academics, think tanks, patients, groups, laypersons. Um, and so I think in this concept of regimes of um, um, normativity, um, we can see how it can also extend beyond uh, national boundaries, especially in the paper he's developed for New Genetic Society, where we see consensus uh, in some topics um, between the United States uh, Europe and the uh, UK. And so what I think is important about this concept is that it enables us to expand the range of actors um, who are considered to be involved in have a stake in deliberating norms, guidelines, and ethical principles in relationship to scientific and technological developments. Um, I think, and this especially came out, I think, um, in uh, Stina and uh, in Kim Lee's uh, comments, um, is I think that the other thing that's important about these regimes of normativity is it really enables us to think about the importance of a local or national context uh, in shaping and framing um, ethical uh, debates. So if we think about the example of the UK, which I'm more familiar with, we can think about the importance of the role of institutions such as the Human Fertilization and Biology Authority, um, the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, um, the role of the Wellcome Trust, um, to name a few UK examples. Um, so while there is this pluralism of different actors that have an influence on policy, 
Um, we can also think about, you know, the, the institutional importance of certain actors, you know, that help to frame, shape debate, um, and inform policy discussion, and of course, um, provide funding uh, to a number of researchers um, so we can go out and do more uh, kinds of stuff. I think the, the other kind of fourth element that I want to bring out of this uh, regime of normativity um, is the kinds of types of boundary work um, that take place within uh, these regimes. Um, and oftentimes, and this comes up more in the, in the paper that Paul's doing for the United Society, um, we can see these distinctions between, say, somatic versus, say, germline engineering as one form of boundary work that happens within uh, the field. Um, or the therapy versus enhancement distinction that is often used to think about uh, genetic intervention. And I guess thinking about the concept of regime of normativity more within um, an international relations context, we can also think about states that will sort of choose to have similar aligned beliefs um, versus actors who are outside of that regime and choose to go their um, own ways. Um, I think we can also think about within these regimes of normativity, what is kind of sayable and unsayable um, in terms of thinking about disability rights, some of the heteronormative implications of uh, technologies such as um, IVF um, and the like. And so what I want to do now is kind of turn to a more sort of macro level analysis of uh, regimes and normativity. And this is especially in the case that you know, Paul mentioned that his analysis was more at the mental level. So I want to kind of think about you know, what he was discussing at a more um, uh, um, macro level. And so I think um, in the case of this, uh, you know, he talked about the evolution of this techno-scientific imaginary um, and in, in particular in relationship to development and increasing routinization of genetic counseling, genetic testing, um, and um, whole genome sequencing. And so I would say that in terms of the broader kind of macro level ethos that has informed this regime of normativity, is liberal humanism and its individualist conception of rights and responsibility. Within the context of genetics and biomedical research, this liberal humanist tradition has privileged individual autonomy, informed consent and choice as key principles informing the development and provision of genetic services. Within the context of genetics, this liberal humanist tradition um, is often challenged when it has to deal with the familial and population level implications of genetics. Um, so if we think about issues related to you know, autonomy, confidentiality, and privacy, they become complicated in the field of genetics where individuals are imbricated in family networks that span over several generations and that have broader population consequences, especially when we think about uh, gene therapy. And to complicate matters further, these familiar ties are not only biological, but they're also deeply effective in both the good and bad meaning of these terms of family dynamics, which can often be complicated for multiple reasons. Um, so, you know, turning back to some of the things that Nicholas and I tried to do uh, in the two papers that we wrote together um, on genetic risk and uh, biological citizenship, we were really trying to question, you know, the kind of neoliberal version of the subject of genetic risk, where individuals are encouraged to be, you know, active in relation to their health, to be prudent, to be knowledgeable, um, to seek information, um, and how genetics became, and what we were focused on is really thinking about how genetics became this kind of site for ethical self-problematization, um, where individuals had to, you know, begin to question their responsibility to others, you know, whether to potential marriage partner, the decision to have children, whether to inform other family members of a potential genetic risk. And I'm very glad that, um, you know, Stina brought up the work of Rudy Iraq, because I think in many ways, you know, the work that Nicholas and I did um, was very much in line with that of Rudy Iraq, um, who, you know, developed the term moral pioneers um, to help us think about you know, the kinds of complex decision making um, that women have to engage in uh, in light of developments of uh, prenatal diagnosis and testing. And so, you know, just as a way of you know, drawing to a close, I think that, you know, this liberal humanist understanding of the individual is increasingly being challenged and questioned, especially by feminist and post humanist scholars who argue that this kind of model of the human was informed by uh, the white European male. 
And I think, you know, Kimberly began uh, to address that one, you know, she focused on um, the work of reproductive and disability scholars um, who are also beginning to question that um, as well. And, you know, one of the things that I like about the work of uh, post-humanist scholars is that their emphasis on how individuals are in in complex sets of relations with both animate and inanimate matter. And I think that this form of thinking helps us to reimagine re our relations to human others and with non-human entities. I think that we're starting to witness kind of the emergence of that has also led us to reimagine um, what social justice can look like and concerns about the global climate crisis. And then, you know, as Paul outlined in his talk, and I'll guess, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll agree with Paul in this sense that, you know, many of the original claims around geneticization in the literature, you know, have not come to fruition or they haven't materialized as we become increasingly aware of the complexity of disease ideology and the multiple factors that shape the expression of the disease. So as many empirical accounting, you know, Paul, um, off of that paper with Katie Finder, um, you know, many individuals have you know, incredibly fuzzy conceptions of genetic causation, and that many clinicians are increasingly seeing you know, genetics as one tool amongst many uh, within their diagnostic um, arsenal. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and, and thank you, Paul, for your, for your presentation. Okay, so thank you both. Um, I'm going to moderate the next 15 minutes, and I'd like to remind our attendees again that you may ask a question either in the Q&A button or you may raise your hand and I will call on you. Uh, to kick off, Dr. Martin, would you like to reply to Carlos Nova's uh, discussion? Uh, not really. I'm, I mean, I can, but uh, I think it'd be interesting to hear what other people think. Okay, I am seeing a question from Anna Lewis in the Q&A, and I will read it. Uh, Paul, I buy the trends you draw on in focusing us on the monogenic regime of normativity. We're also seeing trends towards common conditions, most notably with polygenic risk scores. Do you see a new separate regime of normativity developing here? It was interesting. I was thinking about this exact question. I think it's a great question and one that I'm only just starting to think about. I, I think that um, because I'm a bit of a skeptic about all these things, I suppose, you know, we'll, we'll see how polygenic risk scores go. But if you think about whole genome sequencing as the technological driver of a whole set of new knowledge about uh, disease etiology at this sort of microgenetic genomic level or whatever, um, it's not clear how that translates easily into any sort of therapeutic or diagnostic intervention. Polygenic risk scores appear to do that and offer a way around this problem of actually needing to map the causal uh, action of these different sort of genetic elements, which are far too sort of complex. But if you can basically say, you know, collectively that you can combine some sort of risk algorithm to predict genetic risk based on whole genome sequencing, then uh, I think you've got yourself a whole new paradigm in terms of trying to understand disease etiology of common diseases. So I think potentially, yes, you're right to highlight that. And I have to say, I think this is probably one of the most interesting from a social science point of view, areas to look at, to see the sort of claims and counterclaims about the validity of polygenic risk scores and how they may de be deployed in the clinic. Very good. Okay, I see a few hands raised. Uh, Silke, I am going to unmute you. Actually, I cannot unmute you. Can you unmute yourself, Silke? Yes, I can unmute myself, obviously. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. Um, I like to pick back a bit on Paul's observation, which I found quite um, remarkable and, and interesting is that there is this shift in normativity or in this regime of normativity in focusing first on, on collective responsibilities. And you said you think there is now the, the, the guiding norm, so to say, is more language of rights. I'd like to 
draw your attention perhaps um, also that it might be not only the language or, or norm of rights, but even of justice. And I'm saying so because I think the rights terminology still has, um, at least from a philosophical point of view, um, a purely, um, I mean, a liberal notion, so to say. But I think what is really interesting when it comes to collectives claiming for being more visible, and I think this is uh, what, where you were pointing to the, the rare disease and orphan community, um, I feel it's, it's really exactly linking what uh, Kim was formerly pointing out that they use or that there might be this, this new occurrence that this was a formerly marginalized group within the healthcare system. And I think this is often an argument also brought forward by, by ethicists, for example. And so I think, so, and, and it makes it perhaps even more tricky also from an, a critical sociological point of view that the, that the uh, drive for social justice and for um, caring more about marginalized groups um, somehow brings in a shift that in itself can be then critically um, seen because it uh, has its own dynamics, so to say. Um, so that, that was more perhaps an observation, but I would be interested with whether you think that also makes sense. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is, is uh, look at these claims to, about justice and equity. Uh, inequality would be the language in the UK. Uh, and I think um, it would be very much about uh, this, these groups feeling they've been marginalized, as you say, in the healthcare system. Uh, and their claims to have fair treatment. Of course, this runs up against, in the British context, the uh, health technology assessment done by NICE uh, and uh, the sort of price that's put on a quality, so on, on essentially on a life, uh, and how actually these rare disease therapies turn out to be very expensive per life. And so you get into a whole load of complications here about how much is a right, life worth, uh, claims of justice, and then you have people in health economics who say basically that these are exceptionalist claims that are not fully valid because basically, you know, they're, they're displacing other claims uh, for people who need hip replacements or community care or whatever uh, by making these very powerful, effective, effective narratives about the lives of children, but essentially, which are very hard from a critical point of view to sort of uh, to counter. I'm not arguing that we should. So I think you're right. There's, I think that claims of justice and marginalization are absolutely central to the biopolitics here. Very good. Uh, we have another hand up, this time from Paul. Paul, if you would unmute yourself, because I, I can't do it on my end. I am unmuted. Thank you, Lucas. So, and thank you, Paul, for, for what I thought was a, uh, an extremely interesting talk. We, through our center, are currently funded to... Uh, do a series of interviews, which we're in the middle of now, with parents of children with rare diseases, rare genetic mutations, uh, as well as clinical geneticists, and we'll ultimately be interviewing IRB, Re Research Ethics Committee, uh, members as well. And one of the things that, that has struck me so far that I think echoes what you're suggesting, although you, you can... Uh, I'd be interested in, in, your, uh, in your reflections on it, uh, is the near unanimity that we've heard from both parents and geneticists. When we ask, you know, we point out these are very expensive treatments that will only potentially be useful if they work uh, for one or a very small number of, uh, of people, usually children. Um, who do you think should pay for that? Uh, now, you know, in many parts of the world, the answer would be obvious, the national health system should uh, pay for it. We don't have a national health system. And, and, and yet the answer that's fairly consistently given is the government should pay for it. And so there's an assumption, I mean, part of what I think is in inherent in a rights discourse uh, is that um, rights can't be trumped, right? You can't trade off rights. You can't compromise rights. Rights are, are absolute. 
Uh, and the notion of um, a limited pool of money, difficult allocation decisions, perhaps better uses in terms of the number of people who can be helped or the number of lives that can be saved for equivalent amounts of money spent in other places seems not to enter the picture, uh, the, the, um, the, the dominant perspective uh, is in fact, um, well, of, of course, somebody has to do this and uh, the only entity with the money to, to do this sort of thing is the government. So of course, uh, the government should uh, pay for it. So I, I, I'd be, I, not only would I be interested to hear more about your project as it unfolds, but um, I'd be interested in your reflections on that. I think you're right, and I'm, we're seeing the sort of collision of different sort of both sort of rationales in terms of these sort of claims. But I say, I think what's really strikes me. Uh, so I've been to some of the political meetings in the House of Commons in Parliament, where res these patient organisations, uh, families who've lost children, make very, very powerful, I say, effective claims to resources and to justice and to essentially. Uh, finances through the National Health Service, and that has real political clout. And so um, the way in which these claims are starting to, um, I wouldn't say overly influenced, but certainly sort of shape some of the debates about health technology assessment in the UK are, are very significant. So I think so some of the res these patient organisations, though, I think you're right, they're always going to be looking towards collective forms of payment rather than individual ones, and that means the state, certainly in European healthcare systems, I think the other alternative, though, is to look at new models of drug innovation. And that's where I think drug repurposing and patient-led coalitions that are trying to essentially reduce the cost of creating these new medicines. So there's a number of sort of small companies being set up, often by patient organizations or patients, uh, who are looking to essentially change the um, way in which drug innovation works so that they can re massively reduce the cost using these uh, drugs are already uh, licensed, if you like, using artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things we want to focus on now is these new initiatives, which are trying to change, if you like, the economic dynamics and calculations made uh, and the way in which patient groups are making new claims to resources and to drug innovation, uh, sort of the rights to, to develop these drugs in regulatory systems. I think that's a really interesting development. And if you like, one way out of what might be seen as a zero sum game. Okay, we have a, a question in Q&A from Bob Klitzman. There doesn't seem to have been much acknowledgement of the possibility that monogenetic regime has thus far proved wrong. Do you see or would you expect any more recognition of the faltering of this prior paradigm? Um, so a lot of my career has been spent uh, talking about uh, the, the sort of uh, sociology of expectations. So this is very much about the way in which uh, assumptions and imaginaries about technological progress shape uh, innovation, shape sort of clinical practice, et cetera, et cetera. And I would argue that uh, until very recently, I felt that the whole monument paradigm, you know, this attempt to expand the paradigm into common diseases, you know, has just not gone anywhere um, in any real significant way. Maybe I'm being a bit simplistic about that. Uh, and I think that the continued belief in genetic causation for complex diseases is testimony to that. I have to say in say psychiatry or to that, I'm deeply skeptical about, about the any simplistic genetic narrative about uh, the role of genes in, in psychiatric disorders, for example. I'm not saying that biological factors don't matter. I'm not saying that. But I think this attempt to sort of have this, this genetic paradigm, and I think there's a danger in sometimes saying, oh, the problem is the public understanding of these things, you know, simplistic ideas. I'd say the reason that people have simplistic ideas is often because they've been essentially fed those one way or another by scientists scientific pioneers at different sorts of points in time and the media uh, and you know there's a very complex cultural dynamic going on in how these expectations are created so uh, I, I think you know in 20 or 30 years time when the dust is sort of settling on these things the role of genetic facts in, com in common diseases will be seen as very complicated and not at all deterministic. <laughs> 
Very good. Uh, I'll, we don't have any other questions in the queue. I'll, I'll pose one for either Paul or Carlos. This is open. Um, one thing that I have felt to be one of the major innovations of genomics um, is the application of genetic testing for non-medical traits. And when I think about uh, your, Paul, your model of the regime of normativity, it does seem to be historically defined in uh, disease-related research. And I'm wondering if the, the transition to genetic testing for things like educational attainment um, changes the picture at all, or, or does it apply equally well to non-medical or disease-related traits? I think Carlos can maybe say something about this in a minute. I, I suppose I'm extremely skeptical about the validity, if you like, in the wrong, long run of those, those claims around these tests. So, you know, I might be proved wrong, but uh, so, um, you know, if, that, if that's based on polygenic risk scores, which I think many of them are, you know, we, we shall see. I think that's still a highly contested science um, within, technically within, within the academic community. Uh, and I think it's going to be some way before we actually have a stable sort of discourse and set of technologies and practices around that. But I don't know if Carlos has got any reflections on that. Yeah, I would say most of my research is focuses on uh, genetic testing for diseases, um, which I think, you know, we can, and, and oftentimes, you know, very clear, you know, genetic, um, autosomal dominant or very clear genetic inheritance. Um, so that's what I can mostly speak to uh, in terms of my expertise. And, you know, very similar to Paul, you know, I'm very skeptical and worried when we begin, you know, applying um, genetics to things such as educational attainment, um, you know, things like alcoholism, criminality, um, that's when I start to get really worried um, about the potential implications of uh, genetics. Uh, and I think it's much better to, to really, you know, focus on disease causation um, and focus on genetic testing on, on those kinds of instances where there is a clear connection between disease and um, uh, uh, genes. Uh, you know, I should add that I share that skepticism as well. Um, but I, I do get the impression that um, if we're thinking about how the underlying technology and, and the use of the concepts influences our, our, our normativity about genetics, and, and these tests are available, this research is being done, regardless of its validity, it's, it's a part of history, it's a part of what's going on, and um, it seems like it should be a part of the picture in how we characterize it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't dis disagree with that. Um, I have to say, in the UK, those developments are very uh, much in their infancy and are highly contested. So perhaps that's something more that we need to scholars in the UK need to pay a bit more attention to what's going on in the states. So um, I, I think you're right. I mean, if those claims start to be, you know, gain traction, regardless of what we think about their validity or not, then that they that the promises of that technology and the normative association have consequences, they're performative. Uh, and, you know, I think then that has to be taken very seriously, but I think at the moment, that's not something I've paid much attention to. So I think it's something I'll come out of the meeting with, I'll, I will uh, talk to you more about that. Sure, excellent. Uh, we have, uh, no, we're about out of time here. So uh, thank you again. Uh, let's thank our speakers virtually. And we will transition to the final wrap-up discussion with Catherine Tabb.